bottom sediments of lakes, such as here at Moretta Lake in the Canadian High Arctic, are rich storehouses of information about changes in the local and global environment. The materials that contribute to this information in the sediments come from multiple sources. Atmospheric inputs, such as radioactive nuclides, pollen grains, volcanic ash. Lake inputs, including diatoms, macrophytes, and coronamids. Watershed inputs, such as mineral particles and pollutants, and groundwater inputs of nutrients and toxins. For most aquatic ecosystems, there is a lack of environmental monitoring data, or only short-term records. But the different layers of lake sediments contain these diverse environmental signatures from different times in the past. Lake sediment cores thereby provide an archive of past conditions and a way to make up for this lack of long-term observations. The sampling, analysis and interpretation of these sediment records is called paleolimnology. Professor Irene Gregory Eves is a paleolimnologist at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and here explains the steps in taking a lake sediment core. Hi everyone, today we're here at La Cartel to take a gravity sediment core. So step one is putting on your personal flotation device. Step two is preparing your gear. Now you want to extrude it using a vertical extruder. In the subsequent analysis of these different layers of sediments, one of the most valuable indicators is the assemblage of diatoms. Silica cell walls of these algae are resistant to decomposition, and this record therefore persists in the sediments for hundreds of years or even much longer. Diatoms are especially valuable as indicators because of their enormous diversity of forms and diverse environmental preferences. Professor John Small at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, has been undertaking paleolimnological studies of Canada's Arctic lakes and ponds since the 1980s, with special attention to diatom records. Here, Dr. Gregory Eves talks with John Small about how his early work on Ellesmere Island ponds evolved into a broader pan-Arctic synthesis. So you study the sediment records from several of these ponds to begin with. Were the results surprising in any way? Yeah, I should say that before we did the sediment work, it was actually 11 years of doing the basic limnology and the basic understanding of, of what algae were there and what invertebrates were there, sort of very much fundamental biology, before we actually delved into the sediment cores. And I think a lot of people forget that. They remember some a paper in 1994 in Science when we did the first course showing big changes. But that was actually based on 11 years of sort of fundamental, what is the pH, uh, what are the nutrients in the lakes, and what's living in this large variety of lakes uh, with different ice covers. So it was actually based first on just fundamental limnology and, and uh, biology. Uh, then there was another paper, a follow-up, um, well, one of several follow-ups, but this was a large synthetic analysis involving researchers from around the circumpolar north. And uh, what what were the main findings from that study? Yeah, well, in the 90s, 1994 paper in Science, Marianne Douglas and I, we showed these big, big changes in, in assemblages, which we attributed to climate change. It was very controversial at the time. I think now it's accepted universally that it was lake ice and climate change. Uh, but by the time we got to uh, about 10 years later, there were a lot of other scientists starting to do very similar work, and they were more or less showing very similar things. So we were at a conference in Finland, and we pulled together, it ended up being 26 co-authors, <laughs> And we pulled together around the circumpolar Arctic, people who used the same methods. 
And we could show that it was not just isolated in, say, Ellesmere Island in part of Canada, but we could show uh, varying degrees of these changes depending on where you were. And as predicted, the places that were most sensitive to recent climate change showed the biggest changes where the ones that were a bit, maybe a little later farther south showed less and later. So it really made, I think, a fairly comprehensive study. And now you're continuing to do more work, but mostly in the subarctic. Is that right? And, and yes, what is that about? And also the arc, yes. We're, we're doing a, in various places. In that 2005 paper, we had some cores which were from in areas of the Arctic, like northern Quebec and places around Hudson Bay. They were very slow to warm because of differences in ice cover. Uh, one thing we wanted to do afterwards, because many of those cores were taken before 1995, before things really started changing. We know that since 1995, many of those areas were warming and warming fast. So, for example, some we could test these hypotheses. We can go now using paleolimnology. We went to these places that hadn't changed until the 1990s. And sure enough, for example, they showed the same types of changes, but post-1995, as predicted. And of course, this gives us guidance for other areas too. If, if lakes in the high Arctic and mid Arctic and low Arctic are changing so quickly, what about farther south? So we can start applying these types of approaches here and see, well, with declining ice cover, we're getting other types of changes. Lakes are changing and changing very fast due to climate change. And paleolimnology has played a key role in showing that. Paleolimnology also has many local applications. For example, here at Lake Orta in northern Italy, sediment analyses extended the record of heavy metal contamination back to periods before and during the development of industries in the area. An important prerequisite for all paleolimnological studies is to establish a reliable depth time profile. Several methods have been used to determine the age of sedimented material in lake deposits, with the most commonly used technique based on radiocarbon dating. This is used for older sediments, while more recent deposits from over the last few hundred years are dated with lead to 10. One very useful approach in paleolimnological analysis is to compare records at the top and bottom of a sediment core and thereby calculate the enrichment factor. In addition, this top-bottom method is a widely used approach with other paleo indicators for assessing regional change. There are emerging indicators in paleolimnology with enormous potential for environmental studies. These include pigment indicators of algal blooms, sterile and stanol proxies, and sedimentary DNA. Here, John Small talks with Irene Gregory-Eves about the power of paleo-DNA analysis. One of the types of information we use in paleolimnology that seems to be just exploding over the last few years is sedimentary DNA. Uh, can you tell me why this is becoming so popular and what can it show that perhaps we were missing uh, with the more standard techniques we use in paleolimnology? The answer, answers to those questions are somewhat linked in that because we now have an ability to look at a much broader range of organisms, not just restricted to organisms that leave a subfossil or a different kind of chemical signature, uh, just opens the door in terms of application. The early sediment DNA work was really focused on microbes bacteria primarily and micro eukaryotes, but now people are, are finding mammal DNA and, and so on. Yeah, wow. One interesting example we had in the textbook I found was the uh, an example from a sub-Antarctic island uh, where we're reconstructing mammals, just following to what you just said. Uh, could you expand on that on that example and why that was important? So this was an example by Fisitola and colleagues, and they were interested in what was the dynamics as well as the effect of an invasive rabbit population. So rabbits are not native to the subarctic, subantarctic island. Uh, they were introduced in the late 1800s. And what they found in retrieving a sediment core was that for many years, the rabbits were probably in very low numbers. But then uh, around the 1940s, 1950s, really took off in numbers uh, because they were able to increasingly detect them 
using uh, primers for mammal DNA. While at the same time from that DNA, they also looked at the plant community and noticed that as the rabbit population really increased, that a keystone or taxon of plants uh, largely crashed and was replaced by taxa that were more reflective of disturbed habitats. These new indicators, in combination with the standard proxies such as diatoms, coronamids, and pollen, will continue to reinforce paleolimnology as a vital part of environmental monitoring and research. Mm -hmm.